continuación, disfrutaremos de la proyección de un video. Este es el momento de México. Es tiempo de actuar y de mover a nuestro país. Tenemos el potencial para lograrlo. México cuenta con la mayor de las riquezas, el espíritu y energía de los mexicanos. Mujeres y hombres que imaginan, emprenden, innovan, crean y transforman, porque creen en un México próspero. La fuerza productiva se concentra en las pequeñas empresas, que representan la mayoría de las unidades económicas, fomentan la creación de nuevos empleos y contribuyen con la tercera parte de la generación de riqueza del país. México es también un país de jóvenes, donde más de la mitad de su población tiene menos de 34 años. Por ello, la energía de nuestros emprendedores es la fuerza que mueve a México. Son muchos los mexicanos que ponen en alto a nuestro país, que todos los días se esfuerzan por triunfar. Queremos que estas historias las repitan más mexicanos como tú. De lo que se trata es de que todos los mexicanos tengamos las mismas oportunidades para construir nuestras propias historias de éxito. Por eso el gobierno de la república se fijó la meta de impulsar reformas históricas, cuya finalidad es poner a los tiempos del mundo a las instituciones del estado. Se trata de nivelar el entorno para que los emprendedores mexicanos estén a la altura de los mejores del mundo. Con energías sustentables a costos competitivos, con mayor cobertura y acceso a los avances tecnológicos, con jóvenes mejor preparados, con financiamiento accesible y en mejores condiciones que apalanque el desarrollo, con facilidades fiscales para abrir y hacer crecer negocios en la formalidad. A partir de la reforma será más fácil emprender e innovar, crear una empresa o hacer crecer y consolidar las que ya existen. Porque queremos que todo mexicano que tenga una idea emprendedora pueda materializarla. Que aquellos que al emprender deciden trascender las fronteras de lo posible, transformen su entorno. Que los empresarios cuenten con el respaldo financiero que les permita consolidarse y crecer. Que las pequeñas empresas sean más productivas y con ello, los empresarios y sus familias tengan mayores ingresos y satisfactores. Que las empresas que han decidido exportar, ya sea directa o a través de proveer insumos a grandes empresas globales, puedan llevarlo a cabo. Para ello, la Red de Apoyo al Emprendedor, coordinada por el Instituto Nacional del Emprendedor, te acerca los apoyos que necesitas y requieres para alcanzar tu potencial. La red, como un gran movimiento de suma de voluntades y compromisos de distintos aliados públicos y privados, se compromete con el talento emprendedor de los mexicanos. Gracias a este esfuerzo, casi 334 mil emprendedores beneficiados. Más de 410 mil pequeñas empresas beneficiadas. Se favoreció la creación de casi 4,800 pequeñas empresas. Porque queremos lograr que México se ubique entre los 10 mejores países para emprender. El lugar de América Latina con más oportunidades para el desarrollo de las mujeres emprendedoras y empresarias. Donde la innovación se convierta en un estilo de trabajo de nuestros emprendedores y empresarios. Donde para nuestros jóvenes la primera opción profesional sea emprender en la formalidad. Tú eres el motor que transformará a México. En la historia que los mexicanos estamos escribiendo, tú eres parte fundamental. La suma del éxito de muchos mexicanos como tú, representa el éxito de nuestro país. Eres parte de la generación de mexicanos que está comprometida a mover a México. ¡Bienvenido! Esta tarde damos inicio a la conferencia magistral titulada El Poder de Pensar Diferente, impartida por Andy Cohen. Con una perspectiva única, usa la magia como metáfora para demostrar el poder de pensar diferente 
y superar los supuestos en los negocios. Es consultor de compañías de la lista de Fortune. En sus presentaciones en vivo, demuestra cómo las habilidades de un mago pueden ser aplicadas a muchas áreas del mundo de los negocios. Aunque no es un mago profesional, Andy utiliza la magia como una metáfora para conseguir una experiencia única e inolvidable. Utilaz, utilice el ilusionismo como un vehículo conductor de un potente mensaje donde los trucos se intercalan con nuevas ideas sobre innovación, motivación y liderazgo. Demos pues la bienvenida a Andy Cohen. You're probably wondering what I'm doing right now. And, um, you know, there was a study about the greatest fears that people have. And the first was the fear of death, that we all have a fear of death. The second fear was having to pay taxes. <laughs> And the third fear was the fear of public speaking, of having to get up in front of an audience, like yourself, and to be able to speak. So I decided that I would make a little documentary, which I'll be happy later to share with all of you, of what it's like to give a speech. So last night, I began filming myself as I landed at the airport here in Mexico City, of how I was starting to feel about speaking, and it's fascinating, because for me, I can't speak for other speakers, but for me, about three days before I begin to give a talk, I begin to get nervous, and I begin to sweat, and I begin to, my body starts to feel a little differently. So what I'd like to do right now is just to film the audience, all right? Now I'm going to put the, reverse the role. Now some of you are starting to sweat, right? Right? So, first of all, I have a few questions. Let me, let me get up on stage. I have a few questions, just so I know. Can I have a show of hands of how many people are using the earphones for translation? Just so I can, if, if you're using a translator, please raise your hand. Okay, perfect. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, the other thing I'm going to ask, it's an interesting discussion. I had this idea, and I don't know why it struck me when I landed in the plane, on the plane, landed at the airport, I was listening to music, and it was the turtles singing uh, forever. I don't know if any of you know the song. The turtles, uh, forever, da 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 And all of a sudden I thought, what if I could get the audience to do something? And then I realized, I had a conversation with someone and said, no, no, when you go to Mexico, the people are very polite, but they're a little shy. Now, I've been working in Mexico for, for quite a while, and I, 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 I want to test that assumption, because I don't think it's true. So here's what I'm going to ask. We're going to start at the count of three. We're going to start over here. I'm going to ask everybody to begin the wave, and we're going to do a wave all the way through the audience. All right, let's see if it works. Are we ready? And I'm going to film this. Unos, dos, tres. Whoa! Fantastic. I want everybody to raise your right hand. Put it over your shoulder and give yourself a pat on the back. That was fantastic. Great. Great. Let me just shut this off for now. Buenos tardes. No, no, no. Let's try it in unison. Buenos tardes. Ah, perfect, perfect. So today we're going to be talking about the concept. Ooh, I have to be very careful of that. By the way, I don't have uh, the slides up in front of me. Can we bring the slide up on the uh, projector? This, by the way, you know what this is called? This up here, this screen is called the confidence board. And the reason it's called the confidence board is that it allows me to take a look at slides rather than having to turn 
back and look at them because every time if I do that, it looks like I don't know what I'm talking about. So this is a little trick of the trade, but it looks like the confidence board is not working. Can we get the confidence board working, please? There, there's, there's, a big, there's a big booth back there, but it's all black. They might have gone out for coffee. I don't, I don't know. Are they here? Are you here? Shine the lights if you're here so we know. Oh, shining a light. I see a light go on. Okay, can we try to get this up, please? All right, well, and I will just begin. I will have to try and do this the best way I can with the utmost of confidence. So today we're going to be talking about thinking differently. We're going to be talking about the role of the supuesto, the assumption. Now let me tell you a little about the journey we're going to take today. We're going to start with some stories. I'm going to begin with a personal story, if you'll permit that. And from there, we're going to move into a concept of how we think. And by understanding the process of how we think, we're going to understand how to use that thinking that we do every day and shift it so we're able to think differently. The reason we need to think differently, I don't think I need to explain to you, is because of the shift in the economy the shift in technology, and the shift in the workforce. Rules are being invented every day. And I don't know about you, but I find every day business to be just a little bit more difficult, a little bit harder, a little bit more challenging to keep up with. So I'm going to give you today a discipline on how to keep up with those changes. It's an easy discipline, it's easy to learn, and it's almost natural in how you do it. And then we're going to end on an illusion. Some of you may know that I have, to, I have a love of magic, and so I like to incorporate magic into my presentations, and we will end on that presentation. So let us begin with the story. I live in New York City. And New York City is a wonderful city. How many have been to New York City? Ah, okay. So you know, New York City is a great, great city. There's a lot of movement, a lot of activity, a lot of great things that go on. But the problem when you live in Manhattan is life gets so busy that you don't always leave Manhattan. And in the fall, around September, October, November, the leaves begin to change. And the East Coast of the United States is one of the most beautiful, beautiful places to visit. Because when you go two hours north of New York City, you see the leaves just in these magnificent colors, which I'll describe later. So every year, we get too busy in the city, we miss the changing of the leaves. So one day I said to my wife, let's leave on a Wednesday during the middle of a week. We'll take off from work and we'll drive up and we'll go see the leaves and there won't be anybody around because everybody's working. Because most people go see the leaves on the weekend. And that's exactly what we did. On a Wednesday morning, we left Manhattan bright and early and we're driving up to see the leaves. And halfway up, we get a flat tire. So we spend half of our day fixing the flat tire, changing the tire, pumping the tire, getting it up. We finally get the tire on, and it's now around 3.30 in the afternoon. So we drive to the bed and breakfast where we were staying. We were staying at a bed and breakfast because we were going up to the country. And at the bed and breakfast, we threw our luggage into the room, and then we got into the car and we drove to this National State Park. That is what you're looking at right now. It's a National State Park. The name of it's called the Gunks. It's an Indian term. It's one of the most, actually, po people don't know, that area is one of the most popular rock climbing places in the world. But we weren't rock climbing. We were just going to do some hiking. And we pull into the National State Park, and there is a giant parking lot. There's nobody there. It's the middle of the week. 
So we have our choice of where to park and we pull right up to where the trail starts. And my wife and I begin walking. And this is not a picture of mine. I grabbed this off the internet, but this is what it looked like. The sky was blue. It was even bluer than in this picture. The leaves were gold and red. And oh, they just, they just shine. They were beautiful. The air was crisp. Ah. And my wife and I are holding hands and we're laughing and we're talking and we're looking around and we're just enjoying the magnificent environment that we're in. Now remember, it's the fall and we started late. So that meant around five o'clock, it starts getting dark. And around five o'clock, we realized, oh, uh oh, we have to turn back. We don't want to. We're having such a good time, but we have to turn back. So what we do is we turn back because if we don't, it'll get too dark and we could get lost in a national state park. And that would not be good. So we start walking down, we're feeling good. We get to the trail, the base of the trail, there's our car. We get in the car and we say, you know, let's not go back to the bed and breakfast. Let's go right to a restaurant that we heard about that serves great food. You know, it's chilly in the fall. We'll get a nice bottle of wine. Oh, life is wonderful. Life is great. And we back up out of the parking lot of the parking space, and we pull out, we start to drive, and we drive out the exit, and all of a sudden we see a big chain across the exit. So we stop at the car, the beam of the lights are shining on this chain, and I think, oh, <laughs> what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We are locked in a state park. Now, I haven't said anything at this point. I'm not verbalizing it. It's just these are the thoughts that are going in my head, and I'm assuming my wife has the same thoughts. So the next thing is, well, uh, I guess we have to call somebody. Who do you call? Who do you call when you're stuck in a national park? Do you call a park ranger? Do you call the park services? Do you call the local mayor? I, I, how, you know, do you call a helicopter service to get you out? And then we realize, my wife and I start discussing who do we call, then we start discussing who's going to call, and before we know it, we're getting into an argument. And all of that wonderful feeling that, shh, oh, it just spread up the body. All of that wonderful feeling started draining out. And we became very, very tense. And I said, you know what, I can't take this. And I take the car and I see that there's a little hill to the side of the chain. So the chain is here, there are two posts, and I see a little hill. And I go and I drive around up onto the hill. And just before I get to the top, like to, to ascend the hill, my wife screams, Andy, stop the car. So I stopped the car. I said, what? She said, Andy, look at those rocks. If you go up that hill, you'll kill the bottom carriage of the car. And the worst part is, she was absolutely right. <laughs> Did you know, if a husband is alone in the woods and he says something, is he still wrong? So, I stop the car, we pull it back up, and now we're just sitting there. The lights are showing on the, on the chain. We don't know what to do. And then Deborah, my wife, says something that changes everything. She changes everything. And what does she say? Well, before I tell you what she says, let's rewind what happened. My wife and I took a hike. We were having a great time. It got dark. We got back to the car. We got in the car. We turned the lights on. We go to the exit and we see a chain. Now, what's going on, I want to share this thought process with you because thoughts are invisible. And there's a gentleman named Chris Argyris, and Chris Argyris is a professor at Harvard, a management guru at Harvard, and he created this mind map. It's, this is a map of how we think. Right now, all of you are thinking, and I don't know what you're thinking, and the person next to you doesn't know what you're thinking. 
And if you really consider it, most of business takes place when people are thinking. In a sense, business, the process of decisions are invisible. We can't see them, which is why Chris Argyris created this map, the ladder of inference. Now, in the ladder of inference, it begins the following way. You begin by doing observable data. You collect your data. Then you select your data. And then from that data, you kind of make assumptions. And then you draw a conclusion. Then you adopt your beliefs that drive your actions. Okay, it's a, it's a very logical ladder that you walk up very, you know, slowly. Except the world does not work that way. Uh, particularly now. You know, it used to be you have one job, you, you, get, you, you apply for a job, you get a job, you go your first day on the job, and all of a sudden, all that job description's out the door. You're now doing what you're supposed to do in two other jobs at the same time. Right? Or maybe your business comes up with a, a, a new project with a client, and it used to be a client might give you six months to develop it a year, now they want it in three weeks. We're just running out of time, and we're also conditioned to expect things faster. Everything's on demand. If you tweet, you want a response immediately. If you send an email, you want a response immediately. You know, you can order, you can order your own Nikes online. You know, we live in an on-demand world. We want things now, which means it puts tremendous pressure, tremendous pressure on all of us to keep up. So to keep up, what we do is we use our assumption, the supuesto. And this is my theory, that what happens is we use our supuesto to determine the data that we want to use. So instead of collecting the data and verifying it and then drawing conclusions or drawing our assumptions, we are making our assumptions first and then we are using that to tell us what the data is all about. And that's very, very dangerous. Because what is an assumption? An assumption is something that you accept as true or certain to happen without proof. In a sense, an assumption is really a truth that you treat as a belief. Okay? It's something, it's something that, you, it's, it's really, it's not true. It's really a belief. So, you take it for granted, and most importantly, the assumption, the supuesto, happens subconsciously. In a sense, it's like you're building a house based on faulty bricks. Something is going to break. Some part is going to fall apart and bring the house down. Now, the assumption of the supuesto is a universal concept. I talk about this throughout the world. You can see it appear in multiple, multiple languages. Now, what's interesting is when I begin to talk about the assumption, and I invite any of you afterwards to come up and say hello and share your thoughts and maybe some of your experiences or ask me questions, but there'll always be one person in the group that will come over to me and in a conspiratorial way, in a way they'll whisper, Andy, you know, you really know what to assume means, right? Now, I know what's coming. I know what's coming. And they say, to assume makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> and I get a little concerned because I think I've just spent this whole lecture explaining that assumptions, and I'll tell this right now, assumptions are neither good nor bad. One of the most dangerous assumptions that you can make is this, is to believe that making an assumption or a supuesto makes an ass out of you and me. As the ladder of inference showed, assumptions are a key component in every decision that you make. So the question is, what are you going to do with that assumption that's going to make a difference? And that's what we're going to talk about. So let me explain one thing about doing something different and new. This is called the circle of anxiety. You are all tasked at some point in your career, I don't care if you're a college student moving out into the business world or you've been in the business world for 20, 40 years. It doesn't matter. You are always going to be tasked to think differently. You're faced with a problem or a barrier 
How are you going to overcome it? You need to think differently, which means you have to think of something that hasn't been done before. Here is the circle of anxiety. You have a new idea. <gasps> a new idea. This is great. I have a new idea. I'm going to present this new idea to my boss. Now, when your boss sits there and he's listening to the new idea, a new idea means it hasn't been done before, so your boss now is listening to something that is an unknown. They don't know if it's going to work or not. They don't know if it's a good idea or not. So now they're dealing with the unknown. You know what happens when you deal with the unknown? You get very anxious. You get very, very anxious. And you know when you have anxiety, what do you want to do with anxiety? That's right. You want to get rid of the anxiety. So you want to reduce it. You know how you reduce it? You reduce it by killing off the new idea. And this is one of the reasons that thinking or new thinking is so difficult because it's not just the ability to create it from within, but as we're going to talk about in a few minutes, it's the ability to get others to believe in that idea, to be help people manage their own anxiety. But I show this slide because this is the reality. This is the circle of anxiety. Now let's get to the assumpt strategy. The assumpt strategy says that assumptions are neither good nor bad. It's what you do with them that makes a difference. So let's create a strategy on how to use your assumptions, your supuestos, to minimize dangerous decisions and to maximize new thinking. So what is an assumpt? A-S-S-U-M-P-T. Don't bother spell checking the word because I made it up. I made the word up, and I made it up because I found when I did my own research in using the word, it sticks. The assumpt sticks. What is it? Well, an assumpt is created when you recognize the assumptions that you make. The idea is you are, have these assumptions, and they're floating around in your head and so forth, and what you want to do is you want to take them from the subconscious and you want to bring them to the conscious level. You want to acknowledge that you are making an assumpt. And that's why I say, when people say, I shouldn't assume, I say that's a very dangerous assumpt. Because assuming or making assumptions is a natural key component of the process. So the assumpt strategy says, what you're going to do is you're going to recognize the assumptions that you make and then you're going to decide how you're going to deal with them. Now your assumpt gives you power. When you make an assumption and it's subconscious, when you're not even aware that you're making it, you have one direction to go. The direction that assumption takes you in. And that can be very dangerous. But when you make an assumpt, now you have a power because you have choice. You can accept the assumpt that you just made, okay, I'm going to follow that direction. But now I am aware of it, and that's my choice. Or you can question it. When you question your assumpt, and you say things like, perhaps I could do it differently. Perhaps what my client just told me, or how I hear what my client told me, is not exactly right. Maybe I'm not hearing it correctly. Perhaps my boss who just rejected the idea isn't a total jerk. So it allows these suppositions to come in. Perhaps, what if? And then the other is to reject it. Rejecting your assumptions are the fastest way to think differently, and we're going to illustrate that. We're going to illustrate that in just a moment. So. Let's go back now to that moment when we were sitting out looking at that chain. The lights are illuminating the chain. Deborah and I are full of tension. And then Deborah says something that changes everything. She says, Andy, where's the lock? And I get out of the car and I walk to the chain and I look at one end and I look at the other and I look at the middle, and there's no lock. 
It's just a chain that's on a post. And I unhook the chain, and I put it down, and I walk back to the car with smiles, and as I get to the car, underneath the windshield wiper is a sheet of paper. And it says, if you leave the park after 5 o'clock, make sure you unhook the chain and hook it back when you leave. <laughs> the assumption, right? We saw a chain, and what was our assumption? Ah, come on. We saw a chain, and what was our assumption? That's right, we were locked out. And based on that assumption, all of a sudden, our perception of reality changed. Now we were acting as if we were locked in. We had created a barrier in front of us that didn't exist. And I ask each and every one of you to think about that. What chain are you putting in front of yourself right now? What obstacle do you perceive that is keeping you from getting to your goal? What is that barrier? What is that obstacle? Because that obstacle and barrier might be totally an assumption that all you have to do is to recognize and then you'll be able to open a door to all kinds of new thinking. Let me give you two examples, two examples. The first I'm gonna talk about is something you're familiar with. And it happened in 1980. In 1980, there were two English gentlemen. One was a referee, and the other, I'm not sure if he was a member of the, um, uh, the English um, uh, soccer league, or if he was just a businessman. In 1980, they came up with a concept of why don't we find a way to create a line during the penalty kicks in a football game so that the, the, the players had to stay behind the line and that the refs didn't have to always kind of run back and forth between, you know, the person kicking the penalty, kicking the other team. They have to run back and forth. We could cut down, we could make it easier on the ref, more efficient. Now, when you really think about what they were saying in 1980 is we want to find a way to change behavior. To change behavior. Now think about that. How do you change behavior of football players? They are stars, right? They, they're they're going to be good on the field, but, uh, but they're not going to change their behavior readily. So now let's, let's fast forward to two, the year 2000. That's 20 years later. Because the idea in 1980 when it was presented... Interesting idea, right? You have a spray that goes in front of the football, in the football player's feet that creates the line, and then you can also, for the defense, you create a line. They can't cross over that line. It makes it very easy for the referee to manage. That idea was completely dismissed. The English Football League would not allow it. They wouldn't accept the idea. They were not interested. Now, 20 years later, this gentleman's watching a football game. It's Hein, and, and now by the way, I have to say, he's Brazilian. Please don't hold it against him. Okay. But he's watching a football game, and he got all excited because he had this idea, what if there could be a line? And he got up, and he got out of his chair, and he went into the bathroom, and he went and he took out, uh, he opened up the, the cabinet, took out a shaving cream, and he sprayed shaving cream all along his arm. And then he began to watch as the shaving cream began to dissipate and disappear. And he said, this idea works. This is a brilliant idea. And he got all excited. Now, I, I, I think he's an independent businessman. He's a graphic artist. And he invested a lot of time and a lot of money to develop this product. And he actually joined with somebody who was from Argentina. Now, one of the reasons I'm sharing this story with you is that I know that each and every one of you here, each and every one of you here, at one point has had a great idea. And there's an assumption that goes along with that great idea. You have that great idea. You might have your own business now. You think this is a great business. I have a great product. I have a great service. If you're a student, maybe you're thinking, I have the next great 
invention or innovation, and you're all excited, and there is an assumption that goes with it, and the assumption is, I have a great idea, everybody's going to understand, everybody's going to get it. And then you start telling people about the great idea, and then they start looking at you with this kind of, kind of glazed look. And you're thinking, not like, maybe it's not a great idea. You're thinking, well, they don't get it. Oh, they're an idiot. They're, 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 they're stupid. I had somebody approach me who was in my family who respected my thinking. They presented a great idea, and I told them why it wasn't going to work. They didn't speak to me for two years. For two years. So there's this expectation that great idea. So, so, so he had this idea for a great idea, developed the spray, and he began to patent it. Now remember, that's in the year 2000. Around 2011, 11 years later, I believe in, I, I, am I pronounced Copa? Uh, uh, Copa? The Copa tournament uh, contest, uh, um, football tournament, um, adapted it and to began to use it. And then obviously, um, oops. obviously this year, FIFA in 2014 finally accepted the idea. And you know it was amazing. The first referee to use it, he was Japanese, and he came out and the first time he sprayed it, you could almost collectively hear the billions of people watching this saying, oh, what a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Well, you may have thought of that. But the point is a great idea does not monetize itself. With a great idea, you have to understand that it is a constant process of thinking differently and challenging your assumptions and the assumptions of other people constantly. It's never ending. It doesn't stop. The idea started in 2000, what I say, I mean, in, in 1980, or over 40, you know, 40 years later, it finally becomes to fruition. Those great ideas that you see, you think happen like this, they don't. Now, this is not to mean to discourage you from developing great ideas. What I want you to do is to take your great ideas, and I want you to be able to move them faster through the system. I want them to work for you in a way that is going to make you happier, maybe wealthier, more successful, feel gratified internally that you had an idea that became a reality. And that's part of the assumpt strategy. Because what's going to help you do that is to be able to recognize the assumptions that you're making and then be able to recognize those, decide what you want to do with them. So let me give you an example of somebody who challenged or actually rejected assumptions and did it in a very short period of time with great success. His name is John Osher. Now John Osher is an entrepreneur and he owned a toy company. Now I don't know if you, any, any of you know about toys, but in the toy business you're only as good as your last toy. You can have a great toy for year, you know, let's say 2014, but that doesn't mean your business could go bankrupt in 2015 because you couldn't find another great toy. So he was looking for a toy that could be extended, that had a long life. And he found this thing called the Spin Pop. This is called the Spin Pop. Let me explain it to you. This is a, a lollipop, a sucker, right? And this sells by itself for maybe, it's a candy, right? It sells for maybe uh, 25 cents, maybe a, 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 a US dollar maybe, um, put it into this little thing called Spin Pop, and now you could sell it for $4.99. That's when it was introduced. It now sells for $6.99. It's a huge markup. Now, what makes this so interesting is this little red button. You see this little red button here? Watch when I press this button. It spins. This was created back in 1990, it was the first interactive toy. Think about it. Now, they placed this spin pop at the candy counter, not at this height, but at this height. Why? That's right, because little kids would come up and they would see a red button. And when a little child sees a red button, what do they do? 
That's right, they press it. And once this spins around, are they gonna walk away and say, forget about it? Oh no, they're gonna buy it. This was so successful that John Osher was able to go out and he was able to sell his business and he made a lot of money. But John Osher is an entrepreneur, so he's not the kind of person that just sits back. So he and two other individuals decided they wanted to create another mass product. And so they went to the supermarket and they actually, he told me the story, they had like a, a shopping cart, and they went up and down the supermarket, and they were looking at different items and putting it in the cart, and they were trying to think of, what could we do that's different? What could we do that's innovative? What could we do that, that will, 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 will make a difference? And they got to the section of the toothbrushes. Now, I don't know if you've noticed it, it's fascinating. Over time, the toothbrush section, which was fairly boring, has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. They're all different colors and shapes and sizes and configurations, and, and each one is supposed to do its job. I, I still haven't figured out that if there are 40 varieties, which one is the best? I, I never been able to figure it out, but there's all these different varieties. And John Osher said, this is a growing market. So he identified a specific market growing, and he said, but if we just create another toothbrush, we'll be like everybody else. So what he decided to do was to create an electric toothbrush for under $5. Now let's go back to assumptions. When you're an expert, experts are the ones you listen to because they know. But basically experts, even though they do know, 50% of the time they are making assumptions about things based on their point of view, on their expertise. So in this case, Oral-B, Braun, Sonicare, all of the major manufacturers for electric toothbrushes, they were thinking, <laughs> John Osher, you're crazy. Oh, you're crazy. We are the experts. We know what it takes to make an electric toothbrush. That's why we sell them for 50 US dollars or 100 US dollars or 175 US dollars. There is no way. I mean, you have waterproofing. You can't waterproof for cheap. Yeah, we have torque, which is the motion that it makes, right? We have, we have battery power. There's no way you can make it. We're the experts we know. John Osher listened to all of them and said, you're all making an assumption, a number of assumptions, and he rejected each and every one of them. Now, what gave him the confidence to do that was the spin pop, because he had created this kind of instrument in which you could, one, have a battery, so there's a battery inside here. Two, he created a way to create movement. Now this movement is around. In a toothbrush it has to be kind of up and down. And then the other part was waterproofing. And so he figured that he could, with 80 cents more, waterproof a unit and create a toothbrush, electric toothbrush. He started off on his own, again, thinking this is a great idea, I know what I'm doing, and halfway through the process he realized, you know what, this is a great idea, but the one thing I don't have is the ability to distribute quickly, to distribute this product quickly, because once it's out there, others are going to start imitating it. So he, he partnered with Procter & Gamble. P Procter & Gamble, who is the smartest marketer in the world. And what they came up with, was this, this, the Crest Spin Toothbrush. Back in, 19, in the 1990s, this was the most innovative, most popular product that was introduced into the supermarkets, into the retail business. Now let's go back a little bit. Procter & Gamble, they are the experts. So they presented John Osher with a plan, a marketing plan that included television. And John Osher said, why do we need TV? We don't need television. And Procter and Sam Gamble said, I am the experts. Remember, they are the experts at marketing, but does that mean they know everything? Does that mean they know how to adapt to new things and deal with change? Not necessarily. That's what they're gonna use their assumptions for. So here's what they assumed. John Osher said, your advertising is on the package. And they said, I don't see it, where is it? He said, there's a little button that says, try me. Try me.
And John Osher knew that they didn't need television advertising because as soon as an adult saw this and it was placed like this and they pressed this button and they heard the noise, what were they going to do? They were going to buy it because it was under $5. It was proof of purchase before they even had to make the purchase. This product was phenomenally successful. A half a billion units have been sold. John Osher and his friends invested 1.5 million US dollars in the development of this. They partnered with Procter and Gamble. They had a joint venture. 18 months after they first started working on the prototype, it was so successful that Procter and Gamble bought out John Osher for 475 million US dollars. That's the power of being able to identify industry or typical assumptions and then be able to, instead of just accepting them and treating them as a truth rather than a belief, to be able to understand what to do with those assumptions to overcome those barriers and to become more successful. Now, let's talk about how do you know you're making an assumption? Well, when you say it can't be done, it's impossible. These are symptoms that assumptions are being made. There's not enough time, money, energy, you fill in the blank. Um, oh, I tried it last year and it didn't work. Have you ever been in a meeting where you present a new idea and then somebody says, oh, we tried it last year and it didn't work? Well, that's an assumption. It doesn't mean it's, not, it's gonna work this year. I can tell you a number of products and services that failed 10 years ago that are phenomenally successful now. The client will never buy it. This is another one. Often you have great ideas and you're the first to talk yourself out of it that the client won't buy it. And then there's only one way to do it. This is another very, very powerful assumption, particularly in large organizations or small businesses, particularly when you have an owner that's usually controlling the business. It happens to me, in my business, I have to stop myself from saying, oh, this is the way to do it. This is the only way to do it because there are multiple ways of doing it. Um, let's uh, jump ahead here to, I want to tell you a little story uh, before we conclude. This is a story about myself trying to demonstrate how to think differently. Because, you know, I, 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 my company, Andy Cohen Worldwide, we, we go in and we help companies assess assumptions, then we help them internalize the process, then we have this kind of digital product, a five-minute digital experience that takes place online that gets you to really think differently. So I wanted to experiment with it. So one day I woke up and I decided I am going to shave with my other hand. So I'm righty, so I decided I was going to shave with my left hand. And so what I did is I got up in front of the mirror and I lathered up and I started to shave and I got like about this far and my arm went completely numb. It went completely numb. And my mind started saying to me, Andy, you are an idiot. Why are you doing this? What purpose is it going to serve? And what happened is my mind was like giving me all these reasons, all these assumptions on why I shouldn't be doing this. And I did. I gave up. Next day I woke up and I went right to the bathroom and I didn't even think, I splashed my face with water, put on the shaving cream, and I began to shave. And I got about this far, about halfway through, and my mind started taking over again. My body kind of froze. Third day, I got up and I just said, I'm doing it. I didn't even think, and I did it, and I got all the way through. I was able to shave on the third day, and by the end of the week, I was able to shave with both hands, almost not thinking about it. And I said, this is a brilliant idea. This is a great idea. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have people come up on stage and I'm going to have a sink on stage and I'll have men coming up and I'll have them shaving with their other hand. This will be a great demonstration. And then I said, I am making an assumption. And I turned it into an assumpt and I said, well, wait a minute. It worked for me, but why would I think it would work for anyone else? How do I know? They could get up there and they could just quickly go through. It might not be an effort for them at all. You see, I had to, in a sense, question and then reject my own assumption. And in rejecting that assumption, or rejecting that assumpt, what I did is I said, I need to prove this. And so what I hired a crew, a film crew from NYU, New York University, 
They have a film school. I hired some students and I said, I'd like you to go out and I'd like you to film and ask people to shave with their other hand and document the experience. And that's what I'm gonna show you now. It's a three minute film and this is what I want you to watch. First, I want you to watch their behavior. First, when they're asked to shave with their other hand, what do they do? <laughs> it's impossible. No, can't do it. No, no, cut off my ear. Then, when they accept the process, you're going to see them like, huh? Mm. Ah, ooh, ah, no. You're going to see them making these adjustments, almost in a painful fashion. But when they go through the experience, you're going to see them, and this is what I want you to listen to. Listen to what they say, because they are going to give you insights that you could pay the greatest management guru in the world to come in and to give you advice on how to deal with change, these gentlemen are going to do it in their own words. It's invaluable. So let's take a look, hopefully this will set up, here we go, and we'll take a look at the film. The first steps to making change in one's life is to start with the small things. The sound Today, up just a little. we're gonna be talking about shaving. Now, people usually shave with one hand their entire life, their dominant hand. Mine is my right hand. But what if I asked you to try shaving with your non-dominant hand? How would you react? Probably slice yourself with the other hand. Exactly. No. <laughs> no? Is it an electric shaver? No, just a regular Mach 3. No. If I had plenty of time to do it and I knew I wouldn't cut myself, then, then yes. Would you try shaving for us with your non-dominant hand? I, I could do that, I guess. Fantastic. Fresh razor? I'm definitely Water? slicing myself with this thing. <laughs> Like, I have no idea how this is going to turn out. I knew this was going to be an interesting trip. Let's see wow, that's interesting. How do I... Weird? Yeah, it feels very weird. Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh, wow, that feels so weird. So far, so good. What, what, are your, what are your strategies to deal with change? Probably to remind myself that the way I'm doing something isn't necessarily the only way to do it. Like, I deal with change all the time, but I truly never thought I would shave with my left hand. When a change were to present itself, the ultimate solution's always there, but you gotta find different ways and what's the best way of actually dealing with it. Going the same way you always go is, isn't gonna be the answer. Yeah, that was the first time I've ever shaved with my other hand. Feel fresh? I feel like a new man. Doing an activity that's not typical of my, my daily routine, it, it, it gives me more confidence that I'll be able to handle change in the future. Mm -hmm. I don't normally do anything with my left hand, so I, I literally have no idea how this is going to go. And once I was actually trying it out, it became way easier to do. I didn't do the best of jobs, but I'm sure if I like tried it a couple more times, I'd get very skillful at it. You know, change isn't a bad thing. It's a hard thing. It wasn't so bad. So I'm glad I did it. I, I kind of was in a rut, like writing papers, working, and today I may like go try yoga. So that's an experience of shaving with the other hand. Now, here, I just put this up here for some of you who wanted to take a picture of some of the conclusions that they made because I think their insights were, were really invaluable. And uh, before I conclude, I have kind of two conclusions. Uh, this is just a little, this is something I've observed. Um, and I want to talk to you in, in, in a personal fashion. I, I, I've been doing business in, in Mexico for, for a, a, a few years and I've been coming down, working with people and, and speaking and observing the culture, observing the people. Um, and I've noticed that sometimes in Mexico that Mexicans tend to live in a shadow. I think sometimes they live in the shadow of the US. I think sometimes they live in the shadow of Brazil. And yet, in my observations in dealing with, with people from Mexico, with observing and traveling in the city, and, and this is, working with small businesses as well as really large corporations and going to small towns as well as going to big towns. There is an amazing amount of creative energy. There's an amazing amount of really high quality thinking. There's a, an amazing, I would say, kind of an ambition to really grow and to prosper. 
And I think that the, the people in Mexico need to challenge the assumption that they are not number two, but they are in many ways number one. And they have to look at that assumption in terms of I'm living in a shadow and they have to say, this is just an assumption. Yes, there are certain realities that go on that kind of maybe define it, but I see it as an assumption. And it's one of the greatest assumptions that you as a, as a, as a culture, as a people can, I think, embrace, challenge, and I think if you do challenge, you will find out what's on the other side. And many of you are already discovering what's on the other side. And it is really a very powerful country with really creative energy, smart, brilliant people that have an opportunity not just to change their country, but to change the lives of the countries around them. And I just wanted to share that, share that with you. Agradecemos mucho la participación de Andy Cohen en esta. So, but we're not done yet. <laughs> The other thing I wanted to do before I conclude is really to, to really thank you. Muchas gracias, because, I, you know, I, I, you're all busy people, and I'm taking a part of your day up. And the fact that you're listening, you're engaged, um, I, I really want to thank you for your participation, because it's, it's very, very, very important. So uh, let me, I'll conclude with, I promised, one last illusion. Um, I'm putting this slide up here because I'm inviting you to follow me, to stay in touch with me. You can follow me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn. We also have a thing called the Assumpt of the Month, which if you go to our website, andycohen.com, and you just, you'll see this on the home page, you fill this in, it, it's, it's your, just your email address. We will send you an Assumpt of the Month, which is a newsletter, one or two pages, that takes a, a daily assumption and challenges it. This month, Assumpta of the Month, is around communication, is around how a lot of us make assumptions that allow for miscommunication to happen. It's a really, it's a fun example. I think you'll really appreciate it. So let me conclude. Um, also, by the way, I have written a book called Follow the Other Hand, which you're welcome, I invite you. You can read it on iUniverse is the best place to order it, hardcover or e-copy. So before, let me conclude now with one last illusion, and then I will take my bow. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a Coke bottle disappear. I'm going to make this Coke bottle disappear. Watch. Pay close attention. It happens fast. Here. <gasps> ah. I'll do it again then, I'll do it again. Wow, I, I, usually do, I usually, no one says anything, I don't know. All right, we take the Coke bottle, I'll put it in here, and I make it disappear. <laughs> now, now I know what all of you are doing. You are all right now making an assumption. You are assuming that I am holding the Coke bottle. Correct, right, that's what you're assuming. But, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Mm. Hey. You have to ask yourself now that you've made the assumption, let's turn it into an assumpt. All right, he's holding the Coke bottle, now we turn it into an assumpt, which now gives you three choices. You can either accept it, that I'm holding the Coke bottle, you can question it, or you can reject it. Now, either when you question it or particularly reject it, here are some of the ideas that might come up. You might think, oh, maybe he's using a special bag. Maybe he's using a special bottle. Maybe he did an amazing form of misdirection. Maybe he hypnotized all of us at the same time. You see, when you take your assumptions and you turn them into assumptions, it now gives you a freedom to explore and to think differently. And when you think differently, that's when the magic really happens. Thank you very much for your time and best of luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. Agradecemos mucho la participación de Andy Cohen en la Semana del Emprendedor. A continuación, le entregaremos un reconocimiento. Muchísimas gracias. Ah.
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Les recordamos que a las 4 de la tarde continuamos con nuestras conferencias magistrales. Muchas gracias.